You know, from the moment this little boy opened his eyes, before he, you know, cried out for his mother's milk, before he breathed, even his first breath, he was completely paralyzed. We don't really know if he had any function from his neck down. I'm hoping he did. Maybe it was just he was paralyzed from his waist down. Hopefully he could move his arms and talk and do some normal things. We're not told. And, and, and I think about the parents, and I just can't even imagine how saddened and disappointed these parents were realizing that their son was paralyzed. In that day and age, they called him lame, right? Lame. Did they maybe wonder, was God cursing them for something they did or didn't do? Was it maybe their sin that finally caught up with them? That was a common thought back then. Honestly, I think it's a miracle that they didn't throw this little boy on the trash dump, which most Romans would have done back then. So that tells me they were probably god fearers, probably Jewish, maybe. Well, whatever the case, because we're not told a lot of details, whatever the case, their lives, no doubt, would surely never be the same again as they try to raise their child in an age and in a world where they got very, very little support. Their son would need constant care, constant supervision, right? There's no social services, no support back then, no place you could take him to where you could get a respite or a break. It was a long and exhausting road for these parents. And actually, if statistics are true today, and I'm sure they were probably similar back then, I, I doubt they even stayed together if they were married even in the first place, because we know how hard this can be today. And, and what about this child? He would probably grow up without many friends, if any. He definitely would not be able to go to school. He definitely could not go out and play during the day, during the summers. Nothing, nothing he could do. And, and then I started to wonder, gosh, like I wonder what age they started to bring this boy to the temple courts to beg for money. I mean, my guess is he was probably pretty young. It got this boy out of the house, and, and because they were probably a poor family, at least in their thinking, they were probably going, well, at least you could do something. You could help us put some food on the table. And so I don't know, was the boy six, seven, eight? before they would carry him to the temple and leave him there probably all day. And this happened every single day. They would drag this kid to the temple courts where all he did every day, all day, was sit in the same place and beg for money. For years, probably. And he probably became so familiar in the temple that, and outside of the temple, that he is kind of like a fixture, kind of like, you know, a lamppost or a column. He just, oh, there's, what's his name? The lame kid, the lame man who just begs for money. And that was this poor man's plight in life. I wonder, did people even look at him any longer? Was he just so used to being there? Did he even look up at all when he asked for money? And there he was in the t outside of the temple, the place where the holy of holy was, the place where God was set to live. And on the outside was this man completely lame, paralyzed, dependent, needy. Did he even think about God at all? Did he have any relationship with God? I mean, we're, there's so many details. I'm dying to ask Luke one day when I see him in heaven. And so there he was, and on some day, we don't know exactly what day, um, just like any other day, he gets dragged to the temple courts, and everything seemed normal. These two men enter the temple courts, and this crippled man, again, we don't know his name, which I find so odd, and there was the apostle Peter, and the apostle John, and this man asked for money. He's done this thousands of times before. But Peter, prompted by the Holy Spirit, man, like looks at him, right in the eye, I get this picture, he says, hey, son, look at me. And, you know, because you know how shame works, right? We look away, we look down. I'm picturing this man just said, money, please, please, anything. And I love Peter. And you just see, see this this, this courage, this faith that he has. He looks at this young guy in the eye and says, silver or gold, I do not have. 
But what I do have, I'm going to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And then Peter takes this guy by the hand and lifts him up to his feet. I mean, I can't even imagine what it must have felt like for not only Peter and John, but for this man to suddenly have feeling in his, in his toes and in his ankles and in his feet. I mean, did he stand up and kind of like go like this for a little bit? I mean, we don't know. I mean, how incredible must it have been to suddenly realize that you can walk? And actually, we know he did more than walk. Suddenly, like, he could jump. And actually, the text says that he ran around the temple courts praising God. Wow. I mean, can you imagine what everyone else was doing? They were like going, what is going on today? And this man was overwhelmed with joy, experiencing the healing power of God in his body, in his spirit. It's no wonder why he ran around saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise God, or whatever he was screaming out. And of course, goodness gracious, everyone during that day who was there saw this and said, wow, what, well, what happened? Who are y'all? Peter, John, we've never seen you guys before. What, like, is, what did you give this guy? Like, what happened? And I love what happens. Peter seizes the opportunity. The Holy Spirit is upon him, and he begins to preach the gospel. And that's the context of this sermon we're going to read this morning. Let me just read it because it's powerful. Look with me at um, Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Remember, the man's right there going, hi guys, I'm walking. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of your fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked a murderer to be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this, and by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see, this man right here, and known was made strong. It is in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that, that he has been completely healed. As you can all see, touch him, see him, try to push him over. <laughs> Now, fellow Israelites, I know, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this Messiah would suffer. So repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah whom has been appointed to you, yes, even Jesus Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. And anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel and all the prophets who have spoken uh, uh, and have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant and sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And then Peter drops the mic, <laughs> and that's the sermon. I mean, it's incredible. Peter and John heal a man, use that opportunity to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, and you would think that 
everyone would be like, this is amazing. Okay, Jesus is the way, the only way, great, I'm in. But that's actually not at all what happened. Some did that, yes. Sadly, the Jewish religious elite of the day, they were not happy, right? And so they arrest Peter and John, threw them in jail, bring them before the religious court the next day, call the Sanhedrin. I'm going to look at what Peter then tells the Sanhedrin the next day. But meanwhile, there is this kind of embers of a small revival taking place, 5,000 people. And back then, you know, they only counted men, so it was much more than that. So at well over 5,000 people saw the miracle, heard this sermon, repented, came to faith, and were later baptized. And it's so fascinating to me because the same is true today. You know, the message of the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ always has that kind of response. Some reject it and some embrace it. And so what we've been doing for the past couple of weeks, what we'll do all the way to Easter is we're looking at these eight specific sermons in the book of Acts because... Not only do they explain the gospel and the good news clearly, but they actually show us how the apostles preached the gospel for what we would call evangelism in the first century. And so in Peter's sermon, he actually goes back, and I hope you notice this, and we've been saying this, he goes back to Israel's story, to his Jewish faith, to explain the lame man's healing, and then he makes like a beeline to Jesus Christ. And so what he's going to tell us and what he says is what was new in Jesus actually started first with the people of God, the nation of Israel. And that was his first point is that the gospel begins with the story of Israel. Now, this makes sense because remember his audience was Jewish. They were at the temple. We'll see how Paul does a completely different sermon when he's with what we would call pagan people or Gentile people. And so the story begins with Israel, with God's promise, original promise to a man named Abraham, and that's exactly where Peter starts. Peter tells us and reminds his audience that God's covenant, God's promise to Abraham was the foundational promise of the entire Old Testament. So in Genesis chapter 12, remember God reveals himself to Abraham and says, man, hey Abraham, I know you're nobody from nowhere, um, but I'm going to make you into a great nation, Abraham, and I will bless you, right? So from one man comes the nation of Israel, what we know is the people of God, but that's not all. God's blessing was never meant for Israel to hoard it on themselves, but that's what they ended up doing because remember, God also told Abraham, I will bless you um, so that you will be a blessing, You will be a blessing to all peoples of the earth. We'll actually be blessed through you. You will be a light to the nations. And so God's promise was that for the people of God, for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people to pass on God's blessing to all people. And actually the apostle Paul will pick up on this in in his letters like in Romans and Galatians where he was Well, he'll remind the church of God's promised blessing for all believers, even Gentiles who by faith, not blood, become children of Abraham. And we'll look at that in the weeks to come as well. But somehow, the church today, the evangelical church for sure, has forgot our roots, um, the roots of our faith in the gospel. See, the gospel starts first with the people of God, the story of Israel, but thankfully it doesn't end there. The gospel starts with the story of Israel, but then it finds its fulfillment, its consummation, in other words, in the life and the story of Jesus. But let me back up. What Peter does here before he transitions to Jesus is he places the blame of the death of Jesus squarely on the people who heard this sermon. Did you notice that? Let me go quickly over. He says, You handed them over to be killed. You disowned them before Pilate. You disowned the holy and righteous run. You killed the author of life. It's no wonder he got arrested, right? It's no wonder they were furious. It's no wonder like, dude, who are you? Take this man to the jail, right? (laughs) And then Peter, though, his pastoral heart comes out because he, he then says these powerful words in verse 17, but hey, 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 I know you acted in ignorance, Right? I know you acted in ignorance. See, in the gospel, 
Peter doesn't excuse their sin, he, but he points their gaze and the necessity of salvation to Jesus. And he says, hey, even though you didn't know what you're doing, God knew what he was doing. And Peter, remember, was a living, breathing example of someone who just weeks earlier, um, months maybe, I don't really know the timing, was a leaving, breathing, breathing example of someone who denied Jesus three different times. And now he can now speak from experience about the power of healing and salvation in Jesus' name because he too acted in ignorance. And so that's the first part of his message. That's the first point he would make, right? That the story begins first with Israel, but then he turns the corner. And then he clearly shows how the gospel is centered on and revolves all around the life, person, and work of Jesus Christ. He gives all credit to the healing of this man to Jesus. And it kind of, it blows my mind actually that most people in the crowd during that day love to see this man healed. They were like, wow, that's awesome. But they had a hard time swallowing the truth of the gospel, And so that's why Peter begins to talk about the necessity of faith. In verse 16, Peter says that this man was healed by faith in Jesus' name, right? Faith in Jesus always comes first. Faith is then followed by what we call repentance and then baptism. And what you see in all these sermons is that order. As someone turns to Christ by faith, they then turn away, they repent of their sin, and then they obey Jesus in the waters of baptism. Now, unfortunately, the church over many, many years have gotten this backwards, right? Sometimes we tell people, hey, clean up your life, get your act together, stop doing this, this, and this, and and then come to Jesus. But that's not how it works, right? Jesus calls you. He opens up your heart to him. He sparks faith in your soul and in your life, and then you respond in faith to his call. And notice again how Peter goes back to the story of Israel in verses 17 and 18 because one of the major hurdles for the Jewish people um, for for coming to faith is this, uh, this, in their mind, ridiculous idea that the Messiah would not only come, but that he would suffer and die, right? And that's a hurdle. That was a hurdle back then. That's still a hurdle for Jewish people today. And so Peter actually reminds them from their scriptures and says, hey, you guys, remember all the prophets foretold that it would happen this way. What prophets? Peter says, all of them. Peter points to Moses, Samuel, and says, all the prophets all wrote about that the Messiah would come, that he would suffer and die just this way. And then in verse 19, Peter explains exactly how they can respond to the gospel. Right? The gospel is not just information about who Jesus was and what he did. The gospel is an invitation to turn away from spiritual death and to turn to God, he says, the author of life. And again, the pattern we always see in Acts is believe, repent, and be baptized. Believe, repent, and be baptized. This is how someone becomes a follower of Jesus. This is how we enter into the gospel story of Jesus. And so Peter then describes what happens when someone comes to faith in Jesus. He tells us that when someone responds in faith and repentance, Peter says that your sins are actually wiped out. That's a super interesting word in the original language. To be wiped out means to be washed clean. It means to be completely erased. It means to obliterate, gone forever. In fact, John, who was there, also writes and uses the same word in what's called the book of Revelation, where he says, speaking of God, that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. He'll also say in the book of Revelation that Jesus will never wipe away your name from the book of life. Same word. And so even though they kill the author of life, Peter says, you can be forgiven. You can be cleansed. You can start over again. And I love that because the same is true for us. Adam, what's up, brother? You visiting? Yeah, what's up? How's Florida? Good. Yeah, Florida. Good to see you, bro. This is why no one sits in the front row, right? Like my spit, COVID, um, or, oh, Rob's going to call me out. 
You threw me off, Adam. <laughs> Jesus, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so when we come to faith in Jesus, how the dog's doing? The dog's good? <laughs> They're good. I miss those dogs. Yeah, we babysit it. We used to babysit his dogs, Angel and Bubs, cute dogs. All right. So <laughs> once we come to faith, squirrel, um, you know, our sins are wiped away. We're then filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's really interesting. Peter says, and he doesn't really talk about this in other places that I'm familiar with, but he says that times of refreshing come. Isn't that interesting? So God not only wipes away our sins, not only does he remove them as far as the east is from the west, but he brings refreshment for our souls. And then again, he ends this sermon in verse 21 through 23. He gets back to Israel's story again, connects it to Jesus. He says another blessing of salvation is he actually points to what many theologians call the new creation. He points to that day when Jesus will return to this world again, and he'll make all things new. And so, and they understood this, that, that God will make a new heaven and a new earth, and the curse of sin um, would be wiped out. This soul refreshment would come, this total restoration were all themes in the Old Testament that his audience would know all about. And so he preaches the gospel to them. He takes Israel's story, which was their story, connects it to the story of Jesus, shows them how they can come to faith in him, right? It's faith, it's repentance, it's baptism. And then he's just done. No cute little illustrations at the end, no powerful quotes from, you know, from Tim Keller at the end of his sermon, nothing like that. And then the, the religious folks go, we don't like this. And he's arrested, and he's dragged before the kind of the Jewish Supreme Court called the Sanhedrin. And meanwhile, thousands of people are coming to faith. And I mean, I can't imagine what that would have been like. And they get up the next day and they drag Peter and John in, in, in front of these, this, this kind of the, the elders and rulers and teachers of the Jewish law. And Peter's not done yet. He's not done at all. He's going to let him have it one more time. And then look with me at verse 8. It says, And Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and here it is, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is, and he's quoting from the Old Testament, yet again, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And here it is. This is like the bullseye, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Mm. It's crazy that a man who just recently denied Jesus was weak is preaching now in front of the, the who's who of the day. And so as he concludes kind of part two of his sermon, I love what he does. Did you notice he takes the attention off of the crippled man and even from the apostles themselves and he says, hey, 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 look to Jesus. And let me go back, because what he does, which, we kinda, which I skipped over for a reason, is he, all throughout his sermon, he litters all these different titles for Jesus that all would have sparked their, their imagination. They would all known all these titles. He actually goes back into the Old Testament, just kind of like little darts, throwing darts about who Jesus was to them. Verse 13, he says, Jesus is God's servant. They would have been like, we know what you're talking about. Because the term servant has all kinds of messianic connotations. It's a direct connection to what's called the suffering servant found in the book of Isaiah, chapters 42 through 53. Let me just quote one. See, my servant will act wisely. This is the Messiah. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. This is why Jesus himself said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Peter also says that Jesus is the holy and righteous one. 
Again, for our modern ears, we're like, that's nice. But for these Jews back then, they knew exactly that Peter was drawing on the Old Testament again. Again, in the book of Isaiah, where the name Holy One is used 25 times. And, and, and every time, it was a title for God. Jesus, he says, is also the righteous one. Another title in the Old Testament only used for God. G Peter is declaring to his Jewish audience that Jesus is the holy and righteous one, that he is God. And then in verse 15, he says, Jesus is the author of life. Here's where it gets really interesting. The words for life and salvation in the Greek language, which is the primary language the New Testament was written, come from the same Hebrew word, haya. Everyone say that, haya. Um, it comes from the same Hebrew word, to be alive. To be alive, Right? So there's a play on words here. The title author of life is almost like saying God's salvation. So to be spiritually alive, to have life is to also have salvation. This is why Jesus also claimed to be the way, the truth, and the haya, the life. And then Peter sprinkles in the fact that Jesus is the prophet. In verses 22 through 23, Jesus is the Moses-like prophet who's now rescuing people, not out of physical slavery, but out of spiritual slavery through a new exodus into the promised land of the kingdom of God. And then he says something they would all get. He says Jesus is the cornerstone or the stone. Again, this is another Old Testament image um, where Jesus actually also quoted from this. This is from Psalm 118. Remember in his parable about the vineyard and the rejected son. And so what does this mean? For some, Jesus it becomes the cornerstone to build your life upon. But for many others, Jesus is the stumbling stone that many will reject. So what is Peter doing here? He's pointing out how all these titles, all these images, all of the prophets that the entire New Testament, right, pointed to Jesus Christ. Peter is proving in just a few sentences that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is centered on and revolves all around Jesus Christ. And that's why he ends his sermon his, the second time and says, this is why salvation is found in no one else. John Stott, who's no longer with us, a brilliant theologian and thinker, wrote this. He said, servant in Christ, holy one and the source of life, prophet and stone. These titles speak of the uniqueness of Jesus in his sufferings and glory, his character and mission, his revelation and redemption. All of this is encapsulated in his name and helps to explain its saving power. So what's going on here? I think what Peter is doing is he's trying to explain that both healing and salvation all flow from the good news of Jesus Christ. Healing and salvation all flow from the good news of Jesus Christ. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And again, there's a play on words here. The verb to be saved has a double meaning. It can mean both physical, or watch this, spiritual salvation. Jesus can restore a person both to physical and spiritual health. He did that back in that day through Peter. He still does that today. And that's why the power of this, that's exactly what happens. The power of the gospel was not just some information dumped to this crippled man. The power of the gospel literally got this man physically healed. He was restored physically, spiritually, mentally and Peter takes that, what God was doing, and then preaches the gospel to everyone who was listening. It's powerful. So what 
in the world does this mean for us today? Let me just say this. We at New North Church still believe that God heals today. Like he's not done. This is not just something that was descriptive in Acts. It's also prescriptive. It's both. That's what God did and that's what God continues to do today. And the reality is some of you, like me, are dealing with a physical issue that just won't go away, right? You've done everything to fix it. Three surgeries in your ankle to fix it, right? But man, let's pray for that in Jesus' powerful name. Some of you are struggling with, with a mental health issue that, man, that you've tried everything and it's just not going away. Let us pray for you in Jesus' powerful name today. Some of you have yet to receive salvation. You've been coming. You've been listening, right? But you have not yet made a decision and stepped over the line of faith. Man, maybe today is the day for you. Come and let us pray for you in Jesus' name. There is power in the gospel of Jesus. There is power in these words that Peter preached because there is power in Jesus' name. So I can't think of a better way to end our services today than praying for people who need prayer and want prayer. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And maybe you didn't grow up in church like I didn't, or maybe like when it comes to healing, you're like, well, isn't that like a charismatic thing, Rob? Like, whoa, like what are you doing here? No, this is actually a biblical thing. James chapter 5 puts it this way. James says, if, is anyone among, among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. And here it is. Is, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. So not in my name, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be, say it with me, may be what? Healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, a few things. I'm going to invite up our prayer team and some of our staff and some of our elders and some of our wives. Um, they're going to come up front and they're just going to be ready for anyone that needs and wants prayer. We also have some anointing oil, which is um, just really symbolic of, of God's presence and his healing power. And we can anoint you with oil if you want that. And let me just say this, like I can't promise that God will heal you today because I'm not God right? There, I have no power in myself. But if God chooses to heal you, he can do that. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to obey the scriptures and we're going to have a time of prayer for healing. And so I just want everyone up to stand now. You can just, everyone. And we're going to sing two worship songs to close out our time. And if at any point you feel led to come up for prayer, for physical healing, for spiritual healing, a.k.a. salvation, for mental healing, for emotional healing. Man, if you just want someone to pray for you for, for anything, now's the time to get that prayer. And for you, maybe you're just like, you know, Rob, I'm just uncomfortable coming up. I, you know, like, I don't know those people. I don't, you know, like, that's fine. Pray where you're at. Maybe pray with your family that you came with or, or your spouse that you came with, you know? Pray Use this time as a time for prayer. If you're online watching, you know, you can text us. We'd love to pray with you and for you. You can write out in the chat. We'll do our best to follow up with you. Um, so anytime during these songs, come on up. We'd love to pray with you and for you. Why? Because healing and salvation flow from the gospel story of Jesus. And so, Father, as we enter into this time, God, help us. God, we want to be a church that prays. We want to be a church that is open to you. God, we believe that you heal today. This broken world that we live in, God, is not your design. And so, God, meet us here as we sing, as we worship, as we pray. Would you move in power? Holy Spirit, come and move. In Jesus' name, amen.